Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Champion shout fire. Amen and amen. I'd like to welcome everyone to this broadcast today and it's a delight and a privilege to be here. And um, I welcome every one of you to today's broadcast. My name is Brother O.C. King, the privileged servant of Brother Joshua Igila. That's my papa, and I love my papa for life. I'd like to welcome everyone to today's broadcast. And um, But before we begin, we want to pray. Father in heaven, we thank you. We give you all the glory, all the honor, all the power, all the praise. The maker of the heavens and the earth and the seas and everything that in them is. Lord, we thank you. Lord, we give you all the glory, all the victory, all the honor. Lord, we thank you for the beauty of your spirit. Lord, teach us, reveal secrets to us. May our hearts indict a good matter. Take all the glory in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Today we want to just introduce us to who Satan is. And then who is the devil? Now, <clears throat> it's unfortunate that um, many Christians have grown in their Christian work believing a lie that Satan is the devil. The truth of the matter is there are two separate persons. The devil is not the same as Satan. And it's unfortunate that um, many have always believed that they are one and the same, but they are not. Satan is not the devil. They are two different personalities, two separate persons. But of course, they work towards a common objective, no doubt. But, but they are two different people. And, and, and it's unfortunate that what the church has believed over the years is a Roman Catholic ideology that was given down to them. But if you don't even know the distinction between Satan and the devil, how would you be able to win the enemy when you are attacked? As a matter of fact, who is your enemy? Now, it's interesting that um, the church today sees Satan as their enemy. Yet, the Satan you call your enemy, you don't even know. You don't even understand. So, but also, what are you trying to say? What I'm trying to say is Satan is not your enemy. So I say, what do you mean Satan is not my enemy? Because the truth of the matter is, he is not. And so, as we begin this broadcast, invite your friends. Let's... let's Let's have a good time. Invite your friends and tell them to come and hear what this young funny preacher is saying. And then we'll prove it to you in the Bible that Satan is not your enemy. So we we'll say, well, the ministry of the Antichrist has begun. This is one of them. Well, the truth of the matter is it's not new. People call me Antichrist. People have been calling me Antichrist a long time ago, so it's not new. And interestingly, you may be surprised that I'm not disturbed about it because even Jesus himself was also called the same too. But really, Satan, is not your enemy. Because if there's one person who knew Satan very well, 
That person was Jesus. In Luke chapter 10, verses 19, he said, in fact, from verses 17 to 19, Luke chapter 10, verses 17 to 19, he said, I saw Satan fall from heaven as lightning. So Jesus did see Satan. So Jesus has seen Satan before. Now, follow this carefully. Jesus has seen Satan before. Now, the disciples came rejoicing, telling Jesus, Master, the, the, the devils, the demons actually, are subject to us. And, and Jesus said, don't, don't, don't rejoice. Don't, don't rejoice over that. I just saw Satan fall from heaven. So Jesus has seen Satan before. Now, wherever you are, you can say that with me. Jesus has seen Satan before. So if there's one person who can tell us about Satan, more than any person. That person must be Jesus. I hope those on Facebook and others can hear me clearly. So, if there's one person who knew Satan very well, it must be Jesus because he has seen him. Now, you and I probably have never seen Satan before. So, the question is, what do you know about him? Now, there are Christians who say that Satan is the enemy. We'd like to read something to you, Jesus said. Jesus said, in Matthew chapter 5, when you read from verses 43, Matthew chapter 5 from verses 43, he said, you have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. And if Satan is our enemy, we should hate him, right? He said, you have heard that. But now look at verses 44. But I say to you, love your enemy. Love your enemy. So if Satan is our enemy, we should love him. And that's just what it will simply mean. Because if you were now saying Satan is our enemy, and Jesus is saying, love your enemies, then that means we should love Satan. Come on, it's just logic, common sense. If Satan is our enemy because traditional Christianity has been teaching us over the years that Satan is our enemy. Please invite your friends. Let them join us. Let them join us. They'll be blessed. Because this ought to be the foundational knowledge you and I should have of who Satan is. So that you can know your enemy and know how to, to attack. You see, when I was in the fraternity in in college, um, when we had a fight, because I was in a vicious fraternity, we were, we were, we were tough. <laughs> but when there was a rival fraternal fight, and we don't mean fighting like who dances the most, like we do it in the fraternities here in America. We're looking at fighting, killing, shooting at each other. So. But when there was a fraternal fight, the leader will gather everyone and then will begin to map out strategies. And when I was in the fraternity, I had a fraternal name. The name I was initiated with was Evil Genius. I was a genius in strategy. That was why I was named Evil Genius. That was my fraternal name. I later changed it. But for years, that was my name. I was known as Evil Genius. I can map out strategies to kill, to attack. I can just look at the situation. And that was why I also became the high priest later on. I became the high priest in the fraternity, initiating people. And I will map our strategies on how to go about it and how to attack. Everybody in that fraternity, almost everyone in that fraternity knew me for that. And by that I mean I knew the weaknesses of my enemies, of our rival fraternity. I knew where their hit men were. I knew what to do to get them. I was just good. If there was a plan and they got stuck, they would go and call me. 
As a matter of fact, even when I gave my heart to Christ, there was a fraternity that was trying to fight the fraternity I came out from. And the fraternity I came out from had to reach out to me to stay ask me for strategies. I said, no, I'm not doing that anymore. I live for the Lord now. I was that good. My fraternity name was Evil Genius. So I was a genius. Now, the reason why we said that is because if you say you are a Christian, and you and I say we are fighting a spiritual warfare, how come you don't know who you are fighting? How come you have not even seen who you are fighting? What is the nature of who you are fighting? What do they like? What is their weaknesses? What is their strength? Here, if you and I, by what our ministers, our pastors around the world, our leaders in the church world, have been teaching us, is true that Satan is our enemy, then it simply means that going by what Jesus said, to love our enemies, it means we should love Satan. That's what it will mean. In fact, Jesus said, love your enemies. Pray for those who curse you. Sorry, bless those who curse you. Do good to those who hate you. And pray for those who despitefully, who despitefully use you and persecute you. So, if Satan is our enemy and we are to live by the commandments of Jesus, then we should love Satan. That's what it means. But let, let's show you something. In Matthew chapter 16, Jesus has just finished telling the disciples he was going to die. And having told them he was going to die, it so happened. Um, he gathered the disciples once and then he asked them, who do men say that I am? Well, some of them said you are John the Baptist. Some say you are Elijah. And others say you are Jeremiah and one of the prophets. Now, that's in verses 14 of Matthew chapter 16. Now, if you look at the prophets that were mentioned, they were very, in a sense, terrible prophets. <laughs> John the Baptist was very vicious. Elijah, you couldn't stand him. He can roast anything. Everything looks like barbecue to him. And of course, Jeremiah, he can uproot, he can destroy. He was a prophet. He was known as the prophet of doom. So, but it's amazing that Jesus was likened to these three. It's amazing Jesus was likened to these three. It's amazing. That's how the people of Jesus' day saw him. You and I today, we see Jesus as a gentle person, a gentle, oh, a kind lamb. Again, those are Roman Catholic ideologies given to us. And the Roman Catholics did not see Jesus in his day. But those who lived in Jesus' day are telling us Jesus was, if you see him, you have seen Elijah. So what they saw, what the people saw in John the Baptist, how tough he was, what the people read about Elijah, they saw it in Jesus. What the people read in Jeremiah, read about Jeremiah the prophet, they saw Jesus epitomize it. So Jesus was not a, he was not a gentle lamb as we think. So Jesus was very compassionate. Wherever you see Jesus, there was love. Me, Jeremiah alone did not epitomize love one day. And of course, Jesus did say to the disciples towards the end that he loved them. And, and none of them came to give Jesus a hug. Oh, Jesus, man, thank you for telling me you love me. None of them could even come close to hug him. Even though he told them he loved them. That's to tell you how tough Jesus was. Jesus was not, a, he was not, he was not Tuesday's bread. So you say, I, I wish Jesus was my pastor. <laughs> thank God you even have a pastor. Who is not even as tough as Jesus. The one you can even lord over. Jesus was, Jesus was not that kind of person. Uh, anyway. 
the disciples said to Jesus, some say you are John the Baptist, some say you are Elijah, some say you are Jeremiah, so others say you are some other prophet. We don't know which one. But whichever one you think of, just you are that person. And of course, that other prophet that they were thinking about was Moses. Because Moses was also a no joke. But they just, they just didn't want to mention Moses because they were under the law. And the ministry of Moses was the ministry of death. So obviously the other prophets they were referring, the first person that would come to mind would have been Moses, but they didn't. Why? Because his own disciples saw him as Moses. They saw Jesus as, guy, you are, you are a Moses. Now, Jesus now asks them in verses 15, but who do you say that I am? Who do you say that I am? And all of them kept quiet. <laughs> because each one of them had something to say about what they thought Jesus was. Of course, certainly it wasn't something good. When you read in Acts chapter 10, how God anointed Jesus Christ of Nazareth who went about doing good. That was Apostle Peter talking about Jesus after Jesus had resurrected and gone a long time ago. You are looking at a space of 10 years after the post-ascension of Jesus. Post-ascension of Jesus. 10 years. But as at the time Jesus lived in their day, he would never say Jesus went about doing good. So you need to understand the context. But none of them said anything until Apostle Peter began to say, um, in verse 16, Simon Peter answered and said, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus, in verse 17, said, Blessed are you, Simon, by Jonah. That means the son of Jonah. For flesh and blood had not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And of course, you read down and down. Said, oh, you are this rock. You are, you are Peter from this day. And upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates shall not prevail against it. I give you the keys of the kingdom and all of that. And then he began to tell them about how he was going to suffer and die in verses 21. But now, in verses 22, you find something interesting here. The same Apostle Peter, who had the revelation of Jesus from the Father, took Jesus aside. And the Bible says he began to rebuke him in verses 21, saying, Far be it from you, Lord, this shall not happen to you. Okay, so he thought that because the Father had given him a revelation about who Jesus was. He knew more than Jesus. Just like the way sometimes you can see some people who think they know more than their pastor. But in verses 23 now, this is the part we want you to see. But Jesus now, he turned and said to Simon, to Peter. It was Peter he was talking to. Get thee behind me, Satan, for you are an offense to me. You see? So, here, if there's one person who knew about Satan, it must be Jesus. Jesus said we should love our enemies. But he didn't say we should love the one who is an offense. You see the difference? So Satan is not our enemy. Satan is an offense. So it's okay to love your enemy, but he didn't say you should love the offense. Two different things. Jesus said to Satan, you are an offense. He didn't say you are my enemy. He says you are an offense to me. You are an offense. Two different things. So, to call Satan your enemy, you missed it already. Even with Jesus, Jesus will tell you, you missed it. Satan is not your enemy. Whatever Jesus said was a law. It was a spiritual law. He said, love your enemies. Let, let's show you the character of who is an offense. So that you can understand here. He said, get thee behind me, Satan. You are an offense to me. He didn't say you are my enemy. 
He didn't say, I will pour Holy Ghost fire on you, you my enemies, all my enemies, Holy Ghost fire. Now, we do pray those prayers, no doubt. But I don't want to go into all of that. Somebody says, they both mean the same thing. They don't. An enemy is not someone who is an offense. They are two different people. The difference is between, is like, is, is the difference between day and night. And because many Christians don't understand the difference, some, some of you here watching me now, you are probably surprised to see this for the first time. Although you have read the scriptures before. Let's show you who an offense is. So that you can understand the difference. What makes one an offense. Now, usually, we think an offense is what somebody did to someone. No, there are personalities that are called offense. Let's show you something. Go to Luke chapter 17. Let's understand this. That's what we're asking you. Who have you been fighting? Who have you been fighting? Who is the real enemy? Somebody says, Satan is the enemy. Okay. Jesus said, love your enemy. Does that mean we should love Satan? Well, if you say Satan is your enemy, then love him. But Jesus didn't say love your offense. He says love your enemies. Let's show you something. In Luke chapter 17, from verses 1, the Bible says in verses 1, this is Jesus talking. He said to the disciples, it is impossible that no offenses should come. It is impossible. Now, if Jesus referred to Satan as an offense to him, now, notice the word offenses. Offenses. So, which means there are many of Satan's kind. If Satan is an offense, and Jesus said, get thee behind me, Satan, you are an offense to me, singular. The same Jesus now is talking about offenses. 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 Which means, therefore, that there are many of Satan's kind. Now, pay attention to this. He did not say it is impossible that enemies would come. He, he didn't say so. He says it is impossible that no offenses. That means there are, there are, there are personalities of satanic nature. More. More. He didn't tell us the number. If Satan is an offense, he has his own kind. And his own kind are also Satan in themselves too. He calls it offenses. But notice what Jesus said in that verse 1. He says it is impossible that no offenses should come. So here now, offenses is not Oh, he slapped me, you offended me for slapping me. Oh, he, 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 he took my girlfriend. Oh, that's not what he's talking about here. Here he's referring to spirit personality, spiritual beings. You see, one thing, in the church world today, what the church has never understood is prophetic language. And we thank God for the ministry of pastors. But I think it is better a pastor, if you are going to be very, very effective as a pastor in your life, you must have a prophet around you who can give you understanding of prophetic language so that even when you are teaching as a pastor, you'll be able to know how to communicate. 
But it's unfortunate. You know, one time a, a pastor was introduced to me. He said he wanted to do a study with me. He wants to reason with me. <laughs> and the pastor was sitting in front of me. I was just looking at the pastor. And while I was looking at him, the Lord began to talk to me. He said, don't mind him. What does he even understand? He wants to find faults. He, he came here to argue. I said, you, you say you want to do study, but you came to find faults. He said, no, 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 I just want us to study. Let's reason together and all that. I said, I'm not a wizard. He said, how do you mean? I said, you see, you don't even understand prophetic language. He said, you want to reason to me. In the book of Isaiah, where the Lord said to Isaiah, to tell the people, bring your strong reasons. Let's reason together. He was talking to witches and wizards. I'm not a wizard, so don't come and reason to, with me here. Except you are a wizard, but I'm not. So if you say you want to reason with me, he said, no, no, that's not what I mean. They are barriers. The pastor was trying to teach me now. He said, they are barriers. They reason what Paul said after Paul left. I said, well, I'm not an barrier. So, so if you say you want to reason with me, what do you want to reason? He said, the scriptures. I said, that's why I, tell you, I told you I'm not a wizard. He said, no, no, you are taking it out of context. I said, you see, you don't even understand. And he said, so how can you study with me when you don't even understand my language? He said, so what am I supposed to say? I said, the Bible says, go and study to show yourself approved. He didn't say, go and reason with others. Go and study. He said, so if you came, I said, but I know that the reason why you came was not to study. You came to find force, and I've given you thoughts already. So you have something to talk about. And of course, he had a lot to talk about. But you see, if you are going to be an effective pastor in communication, in the way you teach, you need a prophet so that they can teach you prophetic language. Because today in the church world, today you hear pastors say, Satan is our enemy. Satan is not your enemy. Jesus said he's an offense. There are spirits like that, of satanic nature. They are called offense. That's the most grievous word. That's the most vicious word or description a Christian can ever use to describe someone. Someone says, that's my enemy. That's too light. But to say this one is an offense to me, that means this person. <laughs> but interestingly now, a human being cannot be an offense. That's the point. Because these are, these are, these were terminologies of higher extraterrestrial intelligence that Jesus was trying to communicate. And he was talking to his disciples. Notice what Jesus said. He said, it is impossible that no offenses should come. That means they, are, they, they want to come. But notice what Jesus said. But woe to him through whom they, 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 he gives a personality. They. You don't use they for things. You use they for personalities. Woe to him through whom they come. That means it takes a human being to open the door for these forces to enter. The church doesn't know about this. They are still battling with enemies. Jesus said, if you are an instrument through which Satan can gain passage, you are cursed. Let's see what the disciples said. <laughs> Verses 5. And the apostles said to the Lord, increase our faith. They knew what Jesus was saying. Jesus was talking to his apostles, ordained apostles who had signs and wonders. Apostles that demons were under their feet. They said, this one that you are talking about, Jesus, we don't understand this thing. But well, please help us. Help us. They knew. And of course, one of them that one of these forces targeted was Apostle Peter. That's why in Matthew chapter 16, Jesus said, get thee behind me, Satan, because the force was trying to use Apostle Peter to come. But Apostle Peter himself did not know, did not know that there was a spirit that was trying to invade the world of Jesus. Because everyone has his own world. Trying to invade Jesus' company. Jesus' friendship. 
if Satan can attempt it with Jesus to invade his company, his disciples, Satan, Satan's, let, let's use those words, offenses, those forces, they can also try to come into a marriage through either the husband or the wife. Is that not what happened between Adam and Eve? It's an offense, but you use the serpent. Go to Luke chapter 22. We trust you are learning something. Because I don't know who your enemy has been all this while. Okay. Look at Luke chapter 22, from verses 1. It says, Now the feast of unleavened bread drew near, which is called Passover. That means during the Easter period. And we're in the Easter period. Tomorrow, we understand, will be Easter Sunday. So we're within the Easter period. So uh, uh, expect offenses to attempt to come, but don't be an instrument through which they come into a marriage. They come into a business because you might be bringing someone into a business partnership that you don't understand. He can be a doorway through this, through which these forces can come. That's why sometimes a woman can give birth to a child and the child becomes very wicked and he becomes a suicide bomber. He kills people. But unknown to the pregnant woman, the child she was carrying was going to be the doorway through which these forces were going to invade the world. The same Apostle Peter Jesus was interested in, anointed Jesus, was the same person these spirits, offenses, were trying to invade the world of Jesus. And Jesus said, get back. So Apostle Peter did not even know he was a door that these forces were trying to open, to pass through. So question, before you start praying against Satan, what have you been to them? <laughs> That's one thing you must ask yourself. What have you been to them? Okay. Let's, let's look at something else. In Luke chapter 22, the Bible says, Now the feast of unleavened bread drew near, which is called Passover. And the chief priests and the scribes sought how they might kill him, for they feared the people. So now, these people wanted to kill Jesus. Certainly, they have made themselves um, instruments through which offenses can come. But because they were priests, the anointing was pushing them away as priests. Because this was their, this period was their period to observe the Passover. But notice something in verse 3. Then Satan entered Judas. Entered. You see that? Jesus said it is impossible offenses will not come, but woe to the one through whom they come. So Satan entered Judas. You see that? Look at the word entered. Entered. You see, that is like a door. Like a door. This does not mean Judas Iscariot was possessed. Now, you need to understand. Um, demonic possession is a complete different thing from what we're reading here. Again, like, but because people don't understand these things, they model everything up. Okay. Satan entered. Satan entered. Let me show you something. Go to the same look. Let's read verses. 28. But I say, 
sorry, verse 28. But you, Luke chapter 2, verses 28. But you are those who have continued with me in my trials. And I bestow upon you a kingdom, just as my father bestowed one upon you. Now, notice, Judas Iscariot had been an instrument through which this offense could come in. Remember, they attempted it with Apostle Peter before. Jesus chased him back. Now, Judas Iscariot has become another instrument through which Satan, an offense, could come in. But you would think that was enough. I want to show you something. Verses 28 again. But you are those who have continued with me in my trials. But and, and I bestow unto you a kingdom, just as my father bestowed one upon me, that ye may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom, and sit on thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. Now, remember, Satan had already come through Judas Iscariot. And as at this time, Judas Iscariot was still with Jesus. Jesus still mentioned twelve tribes. You would think he would say eleven. He says 12 thrones. Okay. Now look at verses 21. And please pay attention to the tenses. Pay attention. Verse 31 of Luke chapter 22. See what he says. And the Lord said, Simon, Simon. Simon, Simon. Indeed, Satan has asked for you. Look at the word asked for you. It's in past tense. That means Satan had attempted again. That's what he's trying to tell you. Satan has asked for you that he may sift you as wheat. Now, to sieve, he, he, those of us who grew up from Africa, we understand how to use a sieve. And of course, they do it here. If you want to make a flour free from balls, you, you, you sieve it. Well, what, what do you think a sieve means? Passage. For the real thing to enter. You see that? So humans are instruments, are sieves through which these forces, offenses of satanic nature can penetrate into somebody's world. You might be marrying a woman who is a sieve for these forces. And that's why sometimes you see some marriage have issues. Actually, no marriage was supposed to have a problem. Today, when, when we try to inquire, should I marry this person, should I not? Ideally, it was never supposed to be. But because certain people have become sieves through which these forces can pass through, I don't know that you're getting this. That's why sometimes you can see a pastor say, don't marry this person, marry this one, don't marry this guy. Marry this woman, then marry this guy. Don't marry this woman, marry this other woman. He says, Satan has desired to sift you as wheat, but I have prayed for you. Look at the word pray, is in past tense. So when Jesus was praying for Apostle Peter, Satan retreated and went to Judas Iscariot that Jesus did not pray for. That's why Satan could penetrate. Remember what we told you Jesus said. It is already impossible that these forces will not come. But woe to the one through whom they come. Question. What have you been to these forces? And Jesus said. I have prayed for you that your faith should not Faith. Remember, we read in Luke chapter 17, the apostles said, increase our faith. Jesus said, faith there is the word pistis, persuasion. Because these things can weaken your persuasion. A homie, an ordained up apostle, you mean the forces of darkness can move through me to enter and invade even a church. Enter and invade a marriage. 
enter and invade somebody's businesses. Enter. Apostle Peter couldn't see it. You see, later on when he received the Holy Spirit, he said to Ananias, why have you allowed Satan to fill you up? That means there were a legion of these offenses coming. You see why Ananias had to die? Apostle Peter had to command him to die. Because once he dies, those forces will not have a passage through which they can come and invade his ministry. Because he understood this very, very well. How he almost became like Ananias to Jesus. And how Judas Iscariot ended up becoming like Ananias against Jesus. That's why sometimes you can find yourself attack, become, become an offense to the one you once loved. Jesus said, I have prayed for you that your faith does not fail. But when you have returned, strengthen the other, strengthen the other brethren. Don't let them become an instrument through which these forces called offenses, they of satanic nature. This is the real focus. This is the focus here. This is something you need to know about Satan. So Satan is not your enemy. Because there's just not one Satan. There are many. Jesus calls them offenses. Those were the words of Jesus, offenses. There are many. You, you are thinking it's just one. Jesus said there are many. They are known as what? They are called what? Offenses. Not enemies. Offenses. Now, why is, because we need to know the difference between Satan and devil. Why is those through whom these offenses come are cursed? I thought we should even love them. I thought Paul said we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers. So, so the, the, the person through whom these offenses come is flesh and blood. So why should we curse such a person? Whoa. I thought we were supposed to love one another. Jesus said, love your neighbor. There's a reason why Jesus said, woe to that person through whom those forces come. So if, before you start criticizing Judas Iscariot, you need to understand what saved Apostle Peter was the fact that Jesus prayed for him. Jesus did not pray for, for Judas Iscariot. That's the difference. And this, this Satan, this offense, attempted Apostle Peter twice. So before you start saying Judas Iscariot is this, is that, is that, Apostle Peter, it was because Jesus even prayed for him. So you begin to wonder why was Judah, why was Apostle Peter angry in John chapter twenty one, verse seventeen, when Jesus was asking him, "Do you love me?" He got angry. Lord, you know everything. You know everything. You know everything. That means he say, "You remember what happened." You say, "Satan is after me. Satan wants to use me." This and you know everything. That was why he got angry. Say, so "You know everything." <laughs> Those things are there for a reason. That's why we're trying to let you know. You've been fighting an enemy you don't even know. You don't even know what it looks like, how they operate. If we ask you now who is Satan, until now you will not know this. You'll be going by what the Roman Catholic presumed Satan to be. We're going by what Jesus said that is written in the Bible. So who have you been fighting? Now, the, the person through whom these forces come, why do they deserve the woe, the cost? Why do they deserve to be cost? Let, let, let's show you something. Hmm. Let's go to John chapter 6. <clears throat> because if there was one person who really experienced 
satanic attack the most, it was Jesus. Another person was Paul. But, but you just mentioned Apostle Peter. No, he was, making, he, was a, he was a good instrument through which the enemy would have invaded. You know, our Papa, Papa Joshua Gila, he, says, he said once, he said, if you are working with a man of God, pray for yourself. Leave the man of God alone. It is you. Because you can be the Apostle Peter that Satan offenses can desire to come. These entities. Here Jesus was telling the people, I'm the bread of life. And he was teaching them because he had finished feeding the 5,000. And so the people were looking for him for bread. He said, no, go for the heavenly bread. I am the bread of life. He began to explain those things to them. And of course, the people got angry. Seventy disciples walked out on Jesus. They spat at him, the Bible says, and they cursed him. And said, he you, you wants to make us cannibals. Now, see how how what how they responded <clears throat> verse 60 therefore many of his disciples when they heard this said this is a hard saying who can understand this and when Jesus knew in himself that his disciples complained his own disciples complained he said to them does this offend you now nah. You see, offenses is different from offend. Here he's talking about provocation. Am I provoking you with what I'm saying? That's different from offenses. But English language, what comes to mind when you hear of the word offenses, what comes to your mind is somebody who, who offended me. He did this. That's the, that, it's an offense. He committed a criminal offense and all that. We use that in criminology. No, no, no. Completely different. Like that's what we said. Understanding prophetic language is very key. There are spirits called offenses. Okay. See what Jesus had to say. In verses 63. It is the spirit who gives life. The flesh profited nothing. You see why those forces may need your body? The words that I speak unto you, they are spirits and they are life. So these forces can come through the words a man can speak. These offenses, they can come in through words that people speak. You can hear somebody even say something nice and you know this is, this is one of those spirits talking. A man can say to a lady, you know I love you, I know that, but you don't know who is talking through him. It's one of those spirits. And so the man now, you fell for him now, and now see the man is making a shipwreck of your life. And the same thing too with the woman too. Then the prophet is praying for the woman. Then the woman says, I'm, I'm queen of the coast. I'm this. You begin to wonder. It is, they are not lying. Because the lady became the instrument through which they could come. But this was the same lady who said, I love you. I know of a lady who stabbed her husband with a knife. Oh, we get glass. She broke a glass and stabbed her husband. She came for prayers. And, and an entity was talking through her. And of course, she was delivered. But here, hmm. look at verses. Sixty-four. But there are some of you who do not believe. For Jesus knew from the beginning who they were who did not believe and who would betray him. Now notice, it was not one person. Notice the word they. They were going to be more than one. Apostle Peter was one of them. Judas Iscariot was another person. Look at the word they. He didn't say who he. They. They knew. Thomas was another person too who did not believe. There were many. Philip was another person who did not believe. So there were many. Jesus knew all these people that are surrounding me, that are my good friends, that I can call my... That's why it took Jesus a great while before he finally called them friends. 
in John chapter 15. This is John chapter 6, but it was in chapter 15. He finally said, I no longer call you servants, I call you my friends. But the very moment he called them his friends, that's when this force is penetrated. But all the while he was relating with them as servants, they couldn't get to him. When they attempted, he chased them away. But the moment he called them friends, he said, I, everything I tell you, everything I tell you, everything the Father reveals to me, I tell you. So he was relaxed. Bam, that's where he was nailed. Should I be suspicious of my friends? No, but we're trying to tell you, even Jesus. And he said it. He said, if they did this to me, they would do it to you. Now, let's show you something. Oof. Look at verses 65. Notice the words Jesus used. Notice what he said. And he said, therefore, I have said to you that no one, no one, can come to me unless it has been granted to him by my father. Now, why would he talk that way? The disciples were already with him. He said, let me tell you something. No one can come to me. Not even you. You couldn't have come close to me unless my father brings him. How? Look at verses 44 of John chapter 6. It says, No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. So he's saying, Look, all, the, all you disciples that I have around me, it is because the Father allowed you to come to me. So if it's going to be even an entity that wants to come and get me, the Father must allow it. Otherwise, they can't get me. That's what I said, pay attention to how Jesus talked, what he was saying. We are not saying you are not good. You are an excellent person. But why are things not working around you? I think you should begin to check those you have around you too. My papa has once told me before, he said, well, see, look at the people around you. I praise them. I praise them. Sometimes you may just need to tell everyone to go away from you. We are not saying everyone is bad, but everyone can be an instrument through which these spirits called offenses may want to come into your world and bring blockages. But with prayer, this is why we pray. With prayer, we can push them back, push them back. And then those around you can dwell safely and not become susceptible to these forces. Now, Verse 66 of John, chapter 6. From that time, many of his disciples went back and walked with him no more. That means the father didn't want these people. The father was trying to let Jesus know, you have too many people and anyone here can be an agent. And so they decided to go back. So the father was the one chasing them away. Then Jesus said to the twelve, now notice what he Then he said to the twelve, do you also want to go away? Guess who is talking now? Simon Peter, <laughs> the very guy, the very venerable Simon. That Satan was going to attempt to use twice. But Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of life. Isn't that nice to say? You have the words of life. Come on, you are the man of God. But it was the same Simon, this Satan, described as offense. And there are many of them attempted to use twice to get to Jesus. Also, he's still talking now. We have come to believe and know that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Isn't that nice? He said it in Matthew chapter 16. Shortly after that, Jesus said, sit and go back. <laughs> Isn't that nice? Now, notice something here. You would think Jesus would say, oh, thank you very, very much. Oh, I'm so touched. Thank you very, very much. I appreciate this love, this, 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 this friendship. Thank you. Oh, it means a lot to me. Oh, you warm my heart with what you just said. You think, see what Jesus said. 
in verse 17. And Jesus answered them, Did I not choose you, the twelve, and one of you is a devil? One of you is a devil. So you see the difference between Satan and a devil? A devil is a person that Satan can pass through to come. So you see the, the demons. You see why Apostle Peter now said, resist the devil. The devil is a person, a human being, through which offenses can come. So if you resist such people, you tell them, stay away from my life. I don't want to have anything to do with you again. If you resist them, how can Satan get to you? So you must know the people around you that you know the enemy can use. I've told somebody before, somebody that I cherish, I called him a younger brother. I told him to his face, I said, let's separate. It's better we separate. He was begging me, he even went on his knees begging me, I said, no, let's separate. I said, it's for your own good. Otherwise you'll die. I told him that, I said, otherwise you'll die. It's better we separate. Because of the things I have seen. I knew he was a devil. That doesn't mean he's a bad person. It just means that he was a person Satan could pass through to get to me. So pay attention to the people you have around you. So you see the difference between the devil and a Satan? And the devil is not just one person. Now, nah, nah. if you notice, the Bible says he spoke of Judas Iscariot. How do you know he was talking about Judas Iscariot? That was John expressing an opinion. Because later on in Luke chapter 22, like we, that we read earlier, Jesus said, Simon, Satan has desired you. I only prayed for you. Now, John, because John was a close friend to Apostle Peter, he said, no, he's talking about Judas Iscariot. He wasn't talking about Judas Iscariot at all. Because we see Satan attempt twice to come through Apostle Peter. He didn't have to be Judas Iscariot. If you ask Satan, that spirit, that offense spirit, who would you have preferred? He would tell you Apostle Peter. Now, the same Apostle Peter, without Satan, denied Jesus three times. Three, three times. That's how much Satan, this force is wanted him. So the question is, who are you to your pastor? Who are you to your leader? Who are you to your boss at work? Why is it that it was when they hired you, the business closed down? Why? Why is it that it was when you bought something in that shop that the shop closed down? Why? Why is it that it was when you moved into a neighborhood that the crime rate increased? Why? Go and check yourself. Why? The same thing too, I'm asking myself too. So if there's one thing I never desire to be is to be a devil. So that these spirits called offenses, Satan can move in. Okay. So when you read Paul saying Alexander Herminius in 1 Timothy chapter 1 verses 20. Let's read it. When you read what Paul said, I think we'll dismiss with this. And we trust you have been blessed so far. Um, tomorrow morning... We'll do a live broadcast again like this by 10 a.m. So we'd like you to join us so that we can continue with the part two of this class. But we trust you have been blessed. Here, Paul was making a report to Timothy from verses 18 of 1 Timothy chapter 1. From verses 18, he says, This charge I commit to you, son Timothy, according to the prophecies previously made concerning you, that by them you may wage the good warfare, having faith and a good conscience, which some have rejected. He said, have your persuasion and a good conscience. So one of, the, one of the things that will make you free from being a good conductor, you know, you have poor conductor, good conductor. One of the things that can make you not become a good conductor for these forces called offenses not to pass through you to come is when you have a good conscience. So always ensure your conscience is good. Sometimes thoughts of bitterness, anger can come sometimes. 
So now we see why Apostle Peter was their greatest desire because he's of his conscience. You know, a sister came to meet us recently and said, Brothers, I want to talk to you privately. So I said, What's the matter? I hope no problem. She said, um, All of a sudden, I could not explain it. A strange anger came into me towards you. And you didn't do me anything. I just suddenly got angry. I will see you, I will just get angry, and I could not explain it. I just suddenly got angry. So I, I knew something was wrong. So I had to go and be praying. I said, for how long has this been? She said, for weeks now. Even when you had a challenge, that thing came into me too. It, it, it just came on me like that. I just suddenly started getting angry. So I said, really? She said, yes. I said, let's pray. So we prayed. And she was free. This was uh, last month. She said, all of a sudden, I just suddenly got angry. And I could not explain why. So watch your conscience, protect it, ensure your conscience is always in a good state. Otherwise, that thing gives them invitation. Now, in conclusion, having faith and a good conscience, which some having rejected concerning the faith have suffered shipwreck, of whom are Heminus and Alexander, whom I delivered to Satan that they may learn not to blaspheme. Now, here he's saying he gave them to Satan. Let Satan use them. Let those forces use them. Since they are always attacking me, I allowed Satan to use them. It's okay. Let them use them as doors to come. And when Satan did, something terrible happened to Paul. They fought Paul a lot. Paul said to a church, on three occasions I wanted to come to you, but Satan hindered me three times. Three times. Because those people were around Paul. God bless you. This is how much we can take today. My name is Brother Osi King, the privileged servant of Papa Joshua Igila. And we trust you have been blessed in today's broadcast. And may the Lord keep you strong. And we pray that the rest of your life is the best of your life. Shalom.